element to it. Um, so this U1 could be a subgroup of some larger uh, non-abelian group or something. But uh, we're assuming that the Lie algebra um, has this subgroup of uh, SU3, SU2, U1 and U1. So um, what, we, what I'm going to do is um, show you how we got to a general solution for the charges under the additional U1 um, of the fermions of uh, standard model fields. Um, and we can, um, we can, okay, so, so those, that solution solves the anomaly cancellation conditions. So what I'm going to do to start off with is uh, just as a warm up, remind ourselves about uh, perturbative local gauge anomaly cancellation in the standard model. Uh, and then I'm going to go through and show how some simple techniques from um, number theory can be used to uh, get the general solution for, to this uh, problem. Okay, so first of all, let's try and motivate this. Why would we want to extend uh, the gauge group? Well, um, you know, anyone that's worked on beyond the standard model knows that um, there are many uses uh, for an extra gauge boson uh, or extending the uh, Lie algebra. Um, and so, you know, in order to get something that's effectively the standard model, we're going to have to spontaneously break somehow or break this uh, the additional uh, U1 gauge uh, element. And that can lead to um, extra heavy gauge bosons. And so they have all sorts of uh, uses. Um, they couple to um, fermions, typically. Um, they, there are uses of these extra gauge bosons in, um, in axion physics. They can be used as part of the story to explain the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Uh, one thing that I've been involved with a lot recently is to um, try and explain um, some discrepancies between data um, and standard model predictions in certain B meson decays. Um, and, uh, you know, they can be, so some subset of them, the neutral current ones, can be described uh, by uh, some Z prime um, heavy beyond the standard model gauge boson. They've also been of use in, uh, the additional symmetries have been in use in explaining fermion mass hierarchies. Uh, and indeed, you know, as you all know, uh, in unification. So it's important to emphasize that our analysis um, will cover extensions for which uh, our algebra, the algebra that I've written at the top is only uh, a subgroup. So for example, it'll cover non-abelian extensions where the additional U1 that we add is a subgroup. Okay. So let's um, revise uh, local perturbative uh, anomalies, um, gauge anomalies uh, in four dimensions. Um, and in the standard model, for instance, we have a potential anomaly, as you know, um, which turns out at the end of the day not to be one. But the potential anomaly we could write uh, in terms of this uh, diagram. So. Um, if we look at this diagram on the left hand side, where you have uh, vial fermions traveling in this loop, B uh, is, for example, a hypercharged gauge boson. So that's a U1 gauge boson. Now, if we do naive power counting, um, you find that this is a divergent um, contribution. And so um, to the standard model Lagrangian, we have to add a counter term um, to this, which cancels the divergence. So that's a counter term involving three uh, U1 gauge bosons, um, you know, coupling times some um, infinite factor to cancel the infinity. And of course that, uh, you know, three gauge boson, U1 gauge bosons coupling doesn't um, satisfy, that breaks the original U1 gauge symmetry. You don't have trilinear uh, gauge boson vertices. So what this, um, if this diagram somehow um, exists and is non-zero, of course, it comes with a crossed counterpart as well. Um, it's telling you that the gauge symmetry that you tried to fix initially is, is not a good one. Um, and so the theory is uh, somehow inconsistent. So um, if you do the Dirac, uh, the Dirac-ology of this trace, what you find is that um, for left-handed fermions traveling in the loop, you get a plus sign in front uh, of, the, of uh, some loop integral. Um, and of course, remember these are, so in the standard model, these are massless fermions, they're vial fermions. 
Uh, but for right-handed fermions, you get a minus sign. Uh, and of course, I have at each vertex, I have um, a gauge, the U1 gauge coupling multiplied by the hypercharge um, of the fermion. And so um, each of these diagrams for each fermion looks like some, the same kinematic factor times um, the uh, hypercharge of the fermion cubed. And there's a plus or a minus sign, depending on whether they're left or right-handed fermions. And so when we sum all of these diagrams up, um, we get that uh, some kinematic factor times this factor A, which is just uh, sum of hypercharge cubed over the left-handed file fermions minus sum over the right-handed file fermions. Um, now, as, as is famously true uh, in the standard model, um, the fermions are in representations such that this anomaly exactly cancels. Even within a generation, it cancels. Um, so these are not, uh, so um, this, this, this is telling you that you don't have a hypercharge cubed uh, gauge anomaly in the standard model. Um, but actually, you can re replace two of these hypercharge fields by gluons, um, SU2W bosons, or um, gravitons, and you get different constraints on the hypercharges, um, and they all cancel in the, in the standard model. So what I'm going to do from now on, just to fix notation, is um, I'm going to write all my fields as left-handed fields. Um, and so if we, have, if we want to slot a right-handed field in there, we just take its charge conjugate, which of course is left-handed. Right. Um, and if I um, want to have a look at what the anomaly cancellation conditions um, are um, in more detail, um, then I have written them here. So this is the one with three hypercharge gauge bosons. Um, and, uh, you know, Y of uh, big Q is the hypercharge of the left-handed um, quark doublet, for instance. So I've labeled the uh, hypercharge of the fields in this way. Um, and uh, you get some uh, integer factors in front, and that's just to do with SU2 and uh, color degrees of freedom. So for example, each uh, left-handed quark doublet has three color degrees of freedom, and it's a doublet, so there are, the, it comes in with a factor of uh, six. So um, the, the uh, colored, uh, the two gluon and a hypercharge gauge boson gives you a linear constraint on the hypercharges. Same with the um, SU2 boson, uh, SU2 uh, W bosons and one, um, and one hypercharge gauge boson anomaly. And the gravitational anomaly also gives you um, a linear uh, condition. So these, I'm going to call these ACCs, they're anomaly cancellation conditions. They're going to be central to um, the systems that we want to solve in this talk. Now, it's important to realize that although within one family, um, actually each of these uh, equations gives you zero, um, but that's not the anomaly cancellation condition. The real condition is that the sum over all fermions in your model, so in other words, over all the families, um, gives you zero. And that's going to be important because we're going to consider family non-universal extensions of the standard model, where uh, you know, we're going to introduce some new kind of hypercharges where um, they're not family universal. And, and so one family can cancel against another, for instance. All right, so um, there has been some, uh, well, there's been a lot of work <coughs> on anomaly cancellation in the standard model. And a lot of it's assumed that the hypercharges had to be family universal. Um, so, for example, a recent paper by my colleague David Tong and his student Lohe Siri showed that um, if the hypercharges are quantized um, and family universal but otherwise free, um, the, in fact, the gauge, these gauge anomaly cancellation conditions imply the gravity anomaly cancellation condition. So that sounds like um, quite a surprising result that you know, to begin with, the gauge theory doesn't, which doesn't know uh, about gravity at all, ends up. You know, if you if you satisfy the gauge theory anomaly cancellation, you satisfy the gravitational one. Um, I think 
it's perhaps not as surprising as it at first seems because the gravitational one just tells you really that the trace of the um, hypercharges is, is zero. Um, and so really, you know, because, that, because the gravitational one co coincides with that, the other ones imply um, this in the, in the uh, family universal case. Um, and it's been known for a long time, you can look it up in Weinberg's first field theory book, that um, if we now uh, consider, okay, uh, if we consider um, just real values of the hypercharges. So we, up to now, um, in the standard model, of course, they're rational numbers, okay. If it's a true U1 gauge theory, um, they're supposed to be integers. And of course, um, the only way that U1, uh, theory couples is through the gauge coupling. So you can, you can absorb um, an overall factor of all the charges into the gauge coupling. So the real, um, the real uh, kind of invariant statement about a U1 gauge theory is that the charges are all commensurate. In other words, any ratio of them is a rational number. So, um, okay. But uh, Weinberg considers um, this deformation of the family universal standard model to a case where we allow irrational or just general real values of the hypercharge. Um, and then if you allow the hypercharges of the fermions to float, um, but set the model up otherwise how it is, then the combination of the gauge and the gravitational anomaly cancellation conditions imply just on its own implies is that the implies that the hypercharges must be commensurate. Neither of these things are true uh, when we just consider the anomaly cancellation conditions without the family universal condition. All right, so now what I'm going to consider is uh, I'm going to take the standard model and I'm going to consider some um, effective field theory which is valid above um, the, you know, above some scale, maybe it's TV scale where we have access to an additional U1 um, subgroup. And I'm gonna add three standard model singlets um, to, because uh, I want some right-handed neutrinos. And I'm gonna write these Sorry, as- Sorry, uh, Ben, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So in your last slide, um, the statement by Tong and uh, Tong et al, is, is it pertaining to specifically to um, standard model? Yeah, so you, so you take the, um, standard model you let the and, and with the and you assume that the hypercharges are family universal but you let the hypercharges of the different species be free so in other words the left-handed quarks can have a different charge to the um you know uh, they don't have to be a sixth or whatever they can have a different hypercharge um but it, as long as the hypercharges are quantized mm -hmm. they proved that uh with the and gauge and anomaly cancellation implies that the trace of the hypercharges is zero, which is the same thing as the gravitational one. So I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see this paper, but um, so apart, I mean, is there anything other than numerology apart from, uh, I, I mean, you know, um, numbers cancel, is there any deep physics reason behind this is true or it's just turns out? Well, uh, you'd be, you should have a look at their paper. It's two pages long um, and it uses Fermat's last theorem to prove this. <laughs> so, ah, okay. if you, so, so the second, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's not, it's not trivial to begin with. The second, um, the second one is just, uh, you, you can just solve the, uh, this I'm familiar but, with. But, yeah. Uh, this, so, this, um, but, yeah. But, okay. but this other one, you have to do a transformation and but then you this can I'm familiar with, yeah. You, you, yeah. So the first one, you do a, a transformation, you transform it into some other variables, which are integer variables. Um, and then that's its Fermat uh, equation. So which of course has no solutions uh, famously. So um, yeah. The, the second thing is that regarding the non family universal, I mean, this is also people have uh, worked considerably, especially in the context of a uh, little X theories. Um, where you are put you know, some of some time you needed to put the one of the generations in a in a slightly different uh, you know one third multiplicity order so that all anomalies cancel out because you are playing exactly the same role of it uh, extending the uh, the right handed uh, e one into a different group 
so so that example also people have constructed specifically uh, as far as absolutely yeah yeah absolutely so no that's right i mean I, i'm talking about general solutions of the anomaly cancellation conditions not people have found there's there's hundreds literally hundreds of specific individual solutions right in the literature yeah, yeah, yes but here i'm interested in the general solution which covers all of them Okay, so of course, um, if we add three right-handed neutrinos, um, it's uh, aesthetically pleasing um, because it can explain neutrino oscillation data. Actually, you can get away with just two right-handed neutrinos and explaining the neutrino oscillation data, I believe. But uh, it, you know, given that we've got three families of the other matter particles, let us add um, three right-handed neutrinos. Um, okay. So I'll make this comment here. Um, in the anomaly cancellation conditions, these right-handed neutrinos, which are standard model singlets, they can have non-zero charges of, under the additional U1. Um, and it's gonna be those charges that we're gonna solve for uh, along with the other fields. Um, but if you, want, if you say, oh, I'm not interested in neutrinos, um, you know, maybe the neutrino masses get their masses via some other mechanism. Um, and I want to consider the models with uh, no right-handed neutrinos. As far as the anomaly cancellation conditions go, that's equivalent to setting their charges equal to zero. So if I've got um, a general solution and I can put in zero charges, it, it gives you this case where it's just the standard model without right-handed neutrinos. Okay, so um, rather than write... Um, uh, you know, ben, just uh, one second. Uh, yeah. Ziparno has a question. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, I have a small question. That, uh, typically, when you have uh, like anomaly cancellation per generation, you use the gauge gravity anomaly condition to fix the charges of the like new C, the right-handed neutrinos, like in, in any general U1 extension of the standard model. Now, the other three equations, that is SU2 square U1, SU3 square U1, and U1, there's no U1 cube in family independent thing. Uh, it's just uh, U1 square uh, and this new U1. So they do not contain the right handed neutrino, like, because right handed neutrinos do not have typically hypercharge. So isn't, isn't it a trivial statement that, uh, like, given the first three equations are used to cancel the anomalies in the standard model and the fourth one is used to fix the charges of the right-handed neutrino. So uh, I'm just confused whether it's a trivial statement that the first three equations will always, given the standard model, satisfy the fourth equation, which is the gauge gravity. And like, does, does that question make sense? So you're saying, uh, I didn't quite catch the question. So, so, so we're looking at the equations now, right? No, and not the equations. I understand. The universal. Like this is, uh, yeah, this is extremely, uh, I understand why this is complicated, the family non-universal stuff, but uh, the, the Tongs paper that you were talking about, the proofing Tongs All right, paper. That's without, right. Okay, so his paper w is without right-handed neutrinos. Exactly, that's my point, that typically when there's a right-handed neutrino, like let's say, let me give, give an example, the B minus L extension of the standard model, for example, you fix the charge of the right-handed neutrino using the gauge gravity anomaly equation. In other words, uh, like people sometimes put it in another way that uh, there is a B minus L anomaly in the standard model due to the gravity interactions and you have to add a right-handed neutrino. The first three equations are completely independent of the charge of the right-handed neutrino and they are in any case satisfied. So if there is no right-handed neutrino, isn't the gauge gravity uh, Animal equation or consistency condition on top of like just getting solutions to the hypercharges. Um, I this, mean, the thing, I, don't, I still don't understand your question. What, what was the last bit that you said? Like, if there's no right handed neutrinos, yeah, like, aren't the first like the gauge, the just the gauge anomaly cancellation conditions. Like, don't they fix the hypercharges in the standard model with the gauge gravity one being a consistency condition? Like, if there's a right-handed neutrino, you need that because there's a new degree of freedom in your set of equations. But forget right-handed neutrinos; we don't have them at the moment, right? Okay. That's the so. Okay, so, so it, it, that's what Tong and Lahit theory did. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, uh, so what they show is that, uh, yeah, if it, okay, family universal. So if you take the gauge ones, these top three, they imply this last one. Yeah, that's my question. That is, isn't see, it? Uh, uh, maybe okay, we can maybe later. take it a bit okay, later. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, let's talk at the end, we'll sort it out. Um, all right. So uh, it is a non-trivial statement. Like I say, they had to use Fermat's last theorem. Um, all right, so uh, now instead of writing, um, as I showed you before, I've written all this hypercharge with an underscore Q. I'm gonna have a, a, some charge under the new U1 and I'm, gonna f I'm, not gonna, I'm just gonna write it as QJ, is the charge of uh, the QJ field, okay? And so now um, with an additional U1, now I have six anomaly cancellation conditions. Um, and I think as you were saying, as the last um, questioner was saying, four of these are um, independent of the right-handed neutrinos. You don't see any ends in this, these top three or this fifth one. Whereas the gravity one does have um, this uh, right-handed neutrino. And so does the, um, the new gauge boson cubed that has the right-handed neutrino. Uh, but notice now um, there are, there is also, the, so the top four of these conditions are pretty easy to implement. They're linear equations. And then we have a quadratic and then we have um, a cubic. So we have to have something consistent with all of this. So within the linear subspace um, defined by the top four, we have to find the intersection of a quadratic surface in um, a lot of dimensions, in fact, 18 dimensions, and a cubic surface. Um, so we, are, we already found a partial solution to these, um, so, um, but it was, it's not a full solution. So um, we could tell you what the standard model fermions charges had to be, uh, but we couldn't tell you what the right-handed neutrino uh, charges were uh, in general. And, and even, you know, there were additional conditions which um, the, these charges had to satisfy um, where, uh, which would give you a solution or not. Uh, we, we did show that if you have five right-handed neutrinos, then there were always some um, full solutions of the whole system, um, but we didn't capture all of them. And for less than five, um, and you had to do further work. So it was a partial solution, um, and uh, I found this annoying. <laughs> which is why um, I, pushed, uh, I was pushing Ben and the student um, and myself to try and uh, find the general solution this year. All right. So these six equations, um, we're looking for commensurate solutions, okay? So we have an 18 dimensional parameter space in terms of these charges. Um, it's because it's a U1, we look, we look, they all have to be proportional. Um, and so we look for compact extensions um, uh, of the gauge group. So we're solution. So there are 18 fields, matter fields, um, including the right-handed neutrinos and the three, you know, the three families. Uh, and so we're looking for solutions um, valued over the integers to the 18th. As I said before, we can we we can uh, absorb any overall real gauge factor. Um, into the gauge coupling. Um, and general Diophantine equations are difficult to solve anal analytically over the integer, you know, well, di they're Diophantine equations, so they have to be solved over the integers. And it's a difficult problem. The state of the art in number theory uh, for a general analytic solution of um, Diophantine equations is one cubic in three unknowns. And we've got 18 unknowns and we've got like a linear subspace and uh, a quadratic and a cubic at the same time. So, um, you know, a priori, it's not obvious you're going to be able to solve this. Ben, uh, Tuhin has a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, right, I think it is related to uh, some of the confusions in the uh, last time Triporno asked a question. So, could you go back to your equations one more time? So, in this particular one, um, you are, if I understand correctly, you are, you are solving them um, 
solving the you're trying to find the most general solutions for which all of the equation would be satisfied right without yes. bothering about the fact that we apart from the overall normalizations we already know what q u d l and e are no no sorry right? so now yeah sorry i should have made this so clear. that's the two these, different aspects these, right? these are no longer hypercharges these are new u1 charges ah okay okay sorry yeah sorry so I then see. so we don't know what they are and they could be family dependent i see Okay, got it. <clears throat> okay. So actually, um, we had a run up at this problem, we just use a computer, basically. Um, so um, we found, uh, we, we thought, well, let's try and, um, you know, have a look at uh, solution, all the solutions we can find with low charges. So um, number theory is called the, the maximum magnitude of charge that you're looking for, the height uh, of the representation. So we, we looked for a height of, uh, we managed to solve a height of 10. So notice that, that this isn't um, you know, completely trivial, just putting it on, on a computer. If you, you, you've got 21 values um, between minus 10 and 10 inclusive, um, and there are 18 dimensions, so if you did a, a sort of really naive scan and just really scan through all the charges, that's uh, 10 to the 24 combinations that you'd have to check these six conditions for. So you have to pull a few tricks and you can reduce this uh, significantly. Uh, one, of the, one of the, so of course, you've got a linear subspace, so you can put that in from the start and get rid of four of the dimensions. Um, there is also a permutation symmetry um, between switching family indices and that's uh, got uh, so if you scan things in a clever way you can reduce by a, we can by the dimension of the that permutation uh, which is like seven seven it's like nearly eight thousand um, but anyway so we, we had a look and uh, produced all these lists of charges we made them publicly available um, and you know we were hoping that they might be of use to um, model builders. They're just, um, it's just literally a file with a list of 18 numbers, um, you know, which is many lines long. And each one is an anomaly free assignment. Okay. Um, so you can ask, well, how many of these uh, are anomaly free? And so depending on the height of uh, the representation, uh, what happens is, um, of course, the the fraction of initial possible assignments that you have goes down. And the reason it goes down is because you start off with an 18 dimensional parameter space, but really what these six equations are doing are reducing six of those dimensions. So you get a 12 dimensional or, lo or lower hypersurface within this 18 dimensional space. So the larger and larger box that you um, look at to um, sample your lattice sites, the smaller fraction uh, you're going to get in the hypercube volume that satisfies. So by the time you're out to Q max of 10, you're getting 10 to the minus 12 of the possibilities gives you a solution. Um, so um, looking at it this way, there are more solutions near the origin um, and they get sparser as you get further away. So you can ask uh, how many solutions are there? And uh, down at um, Q max of 10, there are 21 million in equivalent uh, solutions. So that's inequivalent under this permutation symmetry of switching family labels. Um, already at Q max of one, there are 38 solutions, okay? So um, I can tell you, uh, I, can, I can put those on a table. So here are the, char the extra U1 charges of the three left-handed quark doublets, the right-handed neutrinos, right-handed leptons, and so on. And what you can see here, at least for Q max equal to one, um, is that in each case, what happens is one family cancels against uh, another family. So um, there is another equivalence class um, of solution, and that's where you multiply uh, the, all of the charges by a common multiple. So of course, this minus one, zero, minus one solution is the same as minus two, zero, minus two, uh, etc. any integer. Um, okay, so here are the eight uh, solutions which have zero right-handed neutrino charge. Okay. 
All right. Um, now, within this list, uh, we discovered, we, we rediscovered uh, many instances, in fact, all the instances that are anomaly free um, that have been found in the literature. <laughs> so, um, actually, that's not quite true. There, was some, there are some in the literature with higher height, larger height. So, um, for example, we looked through and made sure that we could find um, this one. This solution A was one that I'd worked on. This is uh, called the third family hypercharge model. And it's one where um, the charges of, uh, you know, one of these fields, it matches, is proportional to its hypercharge, basically. We, we use this to help um, explain the neutral current B anomalies. So we found that one. Uh, and, uh, and one that's going to be useful for what comes later is this point B. Um, this is actually B minus L, okay? So if you multiply the B minus L charges by three, um, this is what you get uh, when, once you've changed everything into left-handed field notation. Now, um, you can tell already that this is going to be um, anomaly free, and that's because the the charge assignment here is uh, vector-like, okay? So, of course, you've got um, uh, an up-handed, left-handed up quark here with charge plus one in the, in the left-handed doublet, and there's one with minus one, and, it, and the down quarks match as the same with the leptons. So that's obviously going to be anomaly-free. That's going to, this point B is going to be important for us. Uh, and then C is one of these ones like, that appeared in the previous slide, and um, this C is a family non-universal one. And so one family cancels against another. Okay. Now, um, we want a full general analytic solution for any Qmax. We don't want to be um, stuck to, um, you know, what a computer could find. And we were already, already hitting sort of CPU barriers. Um, and Okay, so the, our first step is going to be convert, to convert this problem into one in geometry uh, by noting that solutions over the rationals are equivalent to those over um, the integers. So you can, so an integer is a rational, therefore that shows the equivalence in one direction. And in the other direction, you can, you can multiply the gauge coupling, clear all the denominators of your charges and get back to the integers. <coughs> So since the rationals are a field, um, we can define geometry on them, and we're going to use geom geometry to solve uh, the anomaly equations. So we start off with an 18-dimensional uh, rational to the 18 solution space, um, and we have this equivalence where all solutions um, where the charges differ by a common multiple are physically equivalent, because it's just equivalent to absorbing it into the gauge coupling. So we define an equivalence class, um, and then you get this projective space um, in the rationals to the 17. Okay, so all that's doing is um, in any two of the charge dimensions, you're identifying all points along this, along each ray, just for, you know, it's a common multiple. So in other words, a two-dimensional surface through the origin becomes a line in projective space, and a line through the origin becomes a point. So it reduces, obviously reduces the dimensionality um, by one. All right, um, so as I said before, our four linear equations um, just restrict um, to a projective subspace. So this is isomorphic, isomorphic to the projective subspace of rationals to the 13. And within this, uh, we need to look for the intersection of a quadratic surface defined here. This is the quadratic anomaly equation and the cubic one defined on the bottom. Now, um, I'm gonna show you why, I'm gonna show you how this uh, business works uh, in a pertinent way with um, defining things on, a, on, a, on the rationals. Let's go back to affine space, you know, ordinary, um, ordinary charge space. Um, and there's this method which goes back to Newton and Fermat, but probably dates back to the Di um, to Diophantus in the third century. And uh, it it's states the following. So a chord um, intersecting a rational cubic surface at two known rational points intersects it at one other rational point. 
Okay, so a rational cubic surface is a cubic surface in um, 3D, which uh, where the coefficients of x squared and y squared and all the terms are, are rational numbers. Okay, that's what the rational surface means. <clears throat> and then uh, the ra a rational point is obviously one with, with rational coordinates. Okay, so um, for example, let's take a rational cubic. And so I'm going to write this, the cubic function of uh, the variables as C. Uh, and then we put a line through two known intersections A and B. So the idea is this line, I can parameterize by some parameter T, and I parameterized it here. And because it's, a, um, because it's a, so A and B are rational numbers because they're rational points. Okay, so we just substitute this line now into the uh, cubic equation. Um, and so uh, I, I've arranged things so that it has to intersect the cubic at t equal to zero, which is at point A, and t equal to one, which is at point B. And so along this line, um, we have to have that the cu cubic equation has to have factors of t minus uh, one and uh, t minus A, I should have put, or, or um, yeah, t zero, in other words. So uh, remember, t0 is, has to be rational. Um, and in fact, if the thing on the left-hand side only has rational coefficients, the coefficient of t cubed has to be rational as well. And so this k has to be rational. Um, so that proves this method of uh, chords. So um, this, is the, this is the thing. We could have not, I've had to say rational quite a lot um, during that um, discussion. What, what I could have done is, in, is instead of saying, oh, we're just in real parameter space, I could have labeled the lines in terms of uh, uh, rationals and nothing would have changed. It's just that I wouldn't have had to say rational a lot. And it, because you can, it's that rational numbers are a field and um, you can divide them and multiply them and add them and subtract them. That means you can, if you start on only with rationals, you can do geometry only with rationals and not, not have to, um, specify things more. So that's why this, uh, you know, projecting down to the rational uh, rationals works. Now there is a caveat here. Um, cubic surfaces don't always have this bendy form. And in fact, the ones that we're going to look at are very special ones. Quite often they're, you know, in two dimensions, they're flat. Um, so for example, a quadratic surface x, y equal to zero um, is obvious, obviously doesn't look um, like some quadratic uh, Parabola, parabola or something. So in that case, um, it is possible that the line lies entirely within the cubic surface so that um, C uh, of the line is zero irrespective of T. And in that case, you've got an infinite number of solutions, not just two. So that's, uh, that's another possibility, but it, it doesn't, it's not gonna cause us any headaches actually. So we're gonna use this method of chords. Now there's another technique I'm going to need to use, um, and it, it, which algebraic geometers are well familiar with, and it's this one of double points. So these double points uh, have multiplicity two, and any partial derivatives of the surface vanish there. So let me take um, this quartic surface here in, in two dimensions. Um, if I plot this, it looks like an infinity symbol. Um, and if you calculate the partial derivatives at the origin with respect to um, uh, along the surface, uh, yeah, with respect to x and y, you find that they're zero. All the partial derivatives are zero. And it, uh, of course, this, this point at the origin actually contains two solutions. So we say that this point at the origin is um, a double point. So the existence of double points is going to help us solve our system. Uh, of anomaly cancellation conditions. And it turns out that this point B, the B minus L point, that's, that is a double point of both the quadratic anomaly cancellation condition and the cubic condition. So I'm ready to give you the full method now, okay? So we have our linear projected subspace uh, projective space of rationals to the 13. Here's our B minus L um, double point. 
Um, and here's this other solution here. It was just an example solution um, C, which this is one of the ones with the, uh, I put one with the uh, families cancelling against each other. Now what I'm going to do is um, choose some point in this space um, and uh, I'm going to scan through all points in this space and because they're rationals, I can do that in a countable way. Um, so I'm going to parameterize this first point. Then I'm going to extend a line to um, C. Um, okay, so if I, if, um, because I'm in rational space here, we have two, uh, two solutions. So this is a solution of all the anomaly equations. That means it lies in the linear subspace, and it also means that um, it's a solution to the quadratic. Um, okay, so now I've got one solution to uh, the quadratic and a line, a rational line going through it. That means that I can use the method of chords to find one other solution to the quadratic, which is guaranteed to be rational. So that's this point R. So <clears throat> there's, there's always at least one other, and there may be an infinity of points, uh, but there's at least one other and I can find it. Now I extend a line between that point and this B minus L double point, And I use the method of chords along, along here. So we have a double point. That is um, a point of multiplicity two. Um, and so somewhere along this line, the method of chords tells me that there's got to be another solution, at least one. There may be an infinity, but there's at least one. So um, I find this other rational solution. And that's it. It's a solution to both the cubic um, and the quadratic uh, found in this way. So, um, yeah. Um, and that, oh, I, I should have said, okay, so B is also, B minus L also solves the quadratic equation. And so um, it's a double point of actually of the quadratic equation. All right. Now R is also a solution to the quadratic equation. So hang on a second. If I consider the quadratic along this line, I've got three solutions to it, two at B and one at R. That means we must be in one of these special cases where the whole of this line lies within the quadratic surface. Okay, that means that um, when I find this point X, which is a solution to the um, cubic, um, it's also, because it's on the line, it's also a solution to the quadratic. Now, the clever bit here is that whichever point S I start with, I, I end up with this uh, solution to both X. And by scanning through all points, or in other words, parameterizing all initial points S, I find all, uh, all possible solutions um, X. All right, now what's it look like? <laughs> so it's a mess, <laughs> all right. So um, what it boils down to is that you, you get a fifth order polynomial um, for each charge. So what I'm gonna, do, so this, these S uh, parameters, these are integers or rational numbers that I input to begin with. And there are, there are parameters that we parameterize this solution in terms of. Um, so um, I've written them here. And then gamma and sigma are just polynomials of those S's. So um, gamma is uh, some cubic function uh, of this point R. Um, and R is given by some quadratic point, uh, quadratic function times, you know, the coordinates of C and so on. These, these bottom four equations here um, give you the linear uh, constraints on the initial parameters. So they specify what these are in terms of the other ones. <coughs> um, okay, and then you've got these delta functions here. Um, these are Kronecker deltas actually, and they just encode the fact when uh, so you, they encode the, the this element where you might have an infinity of lines along, affinity of solutions along the initial line that you extend um, to C. But the, base, the, the bottom line is that this is, a, you pick your uh, parameters, all of these S's, and um, you plug them into this complicated system of equation and you get out uh, 
charges for all of the fields and they're guaranteed to satisfy the anomaly equations. And furthermore, by scanning through all of the S's, you, you scan through all solutions. So, um, okay, this solution space it isn't a manifold. Um, it's, a project, it's called a projective uh, variety. Um, and, uh, you know, it's obviously not a manifold because there are these singular cases of lines within planes where the dim dimensionality decreases. Um, and it's it's not locally, um, uh, you know, mapped to uh, r to the n because they're they're rational numbers anyway. Um, but in any case, we have an overparameterization in terms of eighteen integers. But actually, the solution space is at most eleven dimensional. Um, it turns out these. Okay, you can forget these um, last four because they're just the special case. Um, scenario where some of the other parameters become irrelevant. So then we have um, 14. Uh, then you can remove one because there's an overall scaling invariance. So that's 13. Um, and it turns out that um, we don't need to scan through all points S to get the solutions because we can take all, all points S where the dot product with um, these points in C and points in B, the, the point B uh, are zero. So what we've done is we've checked, um, we've defined an inverse of our parameterization. And that's when you set all, of, so if you've got some um, potential solution T, you just set the charges equal to, um, you, you set the initial parameters equal to the charges. And then with A, B, R and T set like this, then you can show that it, this can, this defines uh, an inverse and it's got to, if, if the original um, T's satisfy the equations then this inverse does and so we check this inverse against all uh, anomaly free atlas solutions and, and they all um, they all indeed satisfy the parameterization um, okay so one caveat is that um, we've considered perturbative anomalies um, but actually the anomaly perturbative anomalies can be cancelled by a, a Vesemino uh, term so in the effective field theory, this looks like a higher dimensional Lagrangian operator of topological origin. Um, and you can get these by integrating out heavy states. So for example, if I integrate out the right-handed neutrinos, you might, and so you're not aware of them in the low energy spectrum, you might uh, conclude that you, for example, have a, um, an X cubed uh, anomaly. Um, um, but, uh, you know, really it's cancelled by the right-handed neutrinos. So, um, in fact, generic West Amino terms are um, hard to generate, apart from this example with the right-handed neutrinos, because you've got to make the relevant heavy states that cancel the anomalies heavy um, from U1 spontaneous uh, breakdown. Um, and because they're charged, that's difficult to, that's difficult to do. They're charged vial fermions, chiral fermions. Okay, and other constraints you might consider on the theory is uh, our perturbativity. So, um, you know, you say, well, that's easy, just set the gauge coupling less than one. But of course, you can, have, you can rescale the charges um, and absorb that into the gauge coupling. So you need an invariant definition of perturbativity. So the, an obvious way of defining it is when the beta function of the gauge group is less than one. Um, so I've written it like the, the beta function is uh, g squared over 24 pi squared times the sum over all um, the chiral fermion charges in the model squared. So uh, this notation means you've got to sum over the chiral fermions, but also the vector-like fermions in this. And in fact, actually, if you've got any scalars that are charged, and presumably you will to do spontaneous breakdown, um, you also have to um, add their charges in. Um, and you get some, um, you know, uh, some upper bound on G, which is invariant with respect to um, scaling all the, um, all the charges. Okay, so to summarize, using some techniques from number theory and algebraic geometry, um, we've got general solution to the full set of anomaly equations for ranking extensions of the standard model uh, in, when you include three right-handed neutrinos. And um, so the couplings of phenomenology of a resulting Z prime depend upon them. 
and model extensions will also depend upon them. So what, I realized that you know the solution we the analytic we solution I presented is is uh, looks a bit hairy. I mean, there's just a lot of it's just a polynomial or lots of polynomials. Um, but it's you know to write it be able to write it on a page. I had to define a lot of functions which is written in terms of. So we've produced attached a Mathematica um, script to um, the paper um, to the archive version of the paper. And there you can literally just set the initial integers and it'll pop out the charges for you and they're guaranteed to be uh, anomaly free. Okay, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, so, uh, Tiparno has a question. Uh, do you want to ask a question again? No, I think that was clarified by what he said later that it's it's just for the hyper charge so there's one less equation so I, I that's clear for me okay so i had one question uh maybe a bit naive because i've not worked on these topics but uh i was wondering uh so you use uh non uh i mean uh cancellations from across families so i was wondering if uh, it has some implications, uh, like physics implications for, um, like uh, uh, some processes which uh, have non-universalities in families. So, for example, uh, couplings of electrons uh, with certain uh, uh, in, a, in a particular process being different from uh, the muonic coupling in some process and. Uh, does this have some implications for like uh, the anomalies in the B sector, etc.? Yeah, you... sure. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, so y y you can't, yeah, yeah, absolutely it does. So, um, you know, you can't just add uh, a coupling to uh, left under, to, to down quarks or to the left under quarks, for instance, and not balance it against anything else. Um, and this, this helps tell you what other couplings that you you know you have to have to add. Um, so it has implications for that. So you'll notice. Um, let me go back to this first solution here. Um, this is one. Uh, okay, so this doesn't cancel between generations. Uh, the reason that this one works, of course, is it's it's just we've implemented kind of like an extra hypercharge in the third family. Um, okay, so uh, and because you know hypercharge satisfies the anomaly cancellation conditions, actually even within a family, then just doing it, doing an additional sort of mega charge, uh, which has the same proportionality, obviously cancels. So, but um, yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, we can't just add uh, one for the Q left. You have to also add some for the other fields, and um, yeah, it's telling you. Uh, we haven't worked out the implications of um, the full parameterization of the solution at all. We've just been, you know, we've, we've just developed it. Um, but it's time to start having a look because it will have some. I have to say, though, it's tricky to work with. This is a disadvantage um, with this analytic solution. Let me see if I can find it. Because if you think about it, each of these charges, now I'm telling you, by the time the dust has settled and you've done all the substitutions in on the right, what you get is a fifth order polynomial in this in the initial parameters. So if you want to um, reverse engineer um, this solution, so you, you say, oh, right, I, I want uh, for Q3, I want some non-zero charge, but I want the other others to be zero. Um, and, uh, you know, because that's going to help me satisfy other flavor constraints, but I'll exactly, have some yeah. third time etc. That's mm -hmm. not easy because now you've got to solve a fifth order polynomial equal to zero in these two variables and one for the third family. So it's not necessarily always, um, it's good for some things, but it's not necessarily easy to, to use and reverse engineer for model building in that way. Um, and yeah, we, have, we need to think more about how one can do this. I mean, in some sense, the original anomaly free atlas, which is just a list of them all up to some maximum charge. Mm. Um, that's really easy to scan through and find, you can just, it's dead easy, you know, write a 10 line script to go through and find 
all the charges um, with with, um, with those properties, and it'll just spit them out. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I guess if not, then uh, let's thank the speaker. Uh, uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, um, and maybe sometime you can actually come here in person and we'll hear it from you then. That would be nice again to do that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.